Good evening, Bill. Good evening. How are you, Nancy? I'm doing well. Good. You've had a summer day. Pardon? This hot summer day. Hot summer day, yeah. Oh. You've had a busy couple of weeks with Inglewood between council and planning commission and yeah. All that fun stuff. That's good. Lots of fun, exciting things happening. Yeah, I missed the uh I missed the uh call last night, but it went well, got approved. It, it did. It, it yeah. was very, very short. Yeah, good. Yep. It was a late night. We had a lot of public comment on dog parks of all things, but huh. got done about ten thirty. Dan, what what time did your item get done? Daniel? Testing, yes. Yes. What time did the item get done last night for you? The meeting uh, got done at 1030, so. Let's see. I think it was uh, 915 or so, something like that. Yeah. It was quick once they got to it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Went very so well. Like, what's the controversy in the dog park? Not too <laughs> bored. That was that was how many, how many hours do you have? <laughs> Are there not a lot of dog lovers on council? <laughs> no, it doesn't. Have, it's just a lot of public comment with people yeah. who, who want the dog parks. Those who live in the neighborhood don't want them because the dogs run up to their kids and jump on them, maybe bite mm. them. You know, just mm. the irresponsible dog owners instead of good ones. Yeah. Mm. It's just a controversial issue. Oh, it was just discussion. Okay. So it'll come back in a couple of weeks. Yeah. We'll decide what to do. If they're gonna close yeah. them down, fence fence the dogs in, fence the kids in. <laughs> That's right. Let the dogs run free, fence the kids in. Well, it is an option. It's come <laughs> up. <laughs> so yeah. you know, just you know, typical local politics, you know all about that. Yeah. We're actually working on a dog park right now so it's really called a canine therapy area ah no kidding it's out at children's hospital oh so, wow that you no know, therapy cool. service type yeah dogs. yeah it's not that anybody can bring their dog in and out right of, right they'd have to be trained but, you know everybody loves their dogs yes we do i've always thought that would be great to have um near senior living yeah. Um, and they have started bringing animals into the senior home, you know, senior living facilities for the elderly. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they're great with the elderly. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, and kitties, yeah. We've got, we um, always kid downtown, it seems like, I mean, the dogs on the streets, I mean, even with COVID, I mean, you know, people that live in these apartments downtown are so always walking their dog and using oh, the, yeah. yep. the sidewalks as the, uh, as the relief area. Oh, the kind yeah. of kid to say, you know, the, it's almost the smaller your unit, the bigger your dog. <laughs> <laughs> I found that. <laughs> it makes no sense, but you see, you see more dogs on the street right now than people. It seems like. <laughs> oh, Council member Russell is on. Well, no, you'd be continuing with dog parks, huh? Yes. Okay. Uh, give me one second. Yep. <clears throat> Council member Russell. Yes. Did you want to speak under public forum? I just want to know if I should call on you or are you just listening? No, I'm just listening. And uh, is there a different way to get into this meeting to listen? No, with no, 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 you're good. I just okay. wanted to make sure. Thank okay. you. All right. Thank you. You bet. Hello, Judy. Hello, happy fourth, belated. And to you, I think it's a happy seventh.
you know, Judy, I don't know how to break this to you, but your, your background doesn't seem to be all summer just yet. There still, still, still seems to be a little snow in your backyard. I wish this was my backyard. <laughs> I'd not. put up with the snow as well. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness. We're getting a full house here tonight. Hey, Kate and Kate and Diane. Hi. Hi, Carl. Hello. <laughs> All right. Looks like Noel is with us now. Hello, Noel. Colin's with us. Whoa. My delay there. How are you guys? Good. How are you? Excellent. Thank you. All right. Nancy, do we have everybody aboard that said they were coming aboard? I believe, other than Mr. Kinton, who I did not hear from, I believe everyone is here. I would just remind everyone to keep their mics muted unless you're speaking, because there will be a lot of feedback. So I'm ready whenever you are. Okay, that sounds good. Well, welcome everybody. Today is uh, July 7th, 2020, uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting. Um, please call the roll. Ms. Townley? Here. Mr. Kenton, I do not believe is on. Mr. Haggerty, our new member. If I can find the unmute button, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Austin. Here. Ms. Brown. Here. Ms. Fuller. Here. Ms. Lepowski. Here. Mr. Atkins. Here. Mr. Adams. Here. And Chair Freemeyer. Here. We do have a quorum, and so let's go ahead and proceed accordingly. The next item on the agenda is, agenda is item number three, which is the approval of the minutes from the May 19th, 2020 meeting. Would there be such a motion? So moved. We'll motion. second. We have a motion and a second by Judy and Kate. Thank you very much. Would there be a discussion regarding the minutes as presented to this commission? Seeing none, please call the roll. Ms. Townley? Yes. Ms. Austin? Michelle? Mouse problems, yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Ms. Brown? Yes. Yeah. Ms. Fuller? Yes. Ms. Lepowski? Yes. Mr. Atkins? Yes. And uh, Mr. Haggerty, I'm assuming you will abstain? Yes, I will abstain. Okay, and Mr. Adams? Uh, yes. Okay, and Chair Freemeyer? Yes. Thank you. Motion passes. Excellent. So we'll move on to item number four. I don't see any public um, on our Zoom call this evening. However, this certainly is available to the public. Is there anybody from the public at this point that may possibly I'm not seeing on my screen that would like to comment to the commission this evening? If so, now would be the time. There is uh, one member who, uh, from the public who is listening, but there are no other attendees. Okay, all right. And so 
the member from the public understands that if you'd like to address the commission, now would be the time and, and we'd be happy to walk you through technically how to do that if you'd like. She does. Okay. Does know how to do it and doesn't necessarily want to address she just the commission. Want, yeah, okay. she just wants to listen. Okay. She's just attending okay, the meeting. Yeah, absolutely. And welcome. We, we appreciate the fact you're here. Um, also, I just want to make a note during this particular time that certainly uh, the, both the video and audio is available to the public. And it's our understanding that um, these will be held in perpetuity uh, for review as, as uh, commission, staff, council, citizens would see fit uh, in the future. So understanding that there's nobody from the public who would like to address this commission, we'll move on to item number five which is Downtown Matters Update. And uh, Dan, I believe you have this, is that correct? That is correct. Floor is yours, sir. Thank you, sir. And I have uh, with me a team of consultants from our Downtown Matters Initiative, and they include Bill Vitek, who's a principal with Dig Studio. Dig is the uh, lead consulting team firm. Uh, also, Brad Siegel, who's president of Progressive Urban Management Associates, Puma, uh, as well as Hillary Portel, who's principal with uh, Portel Works, who has done a masterful job on all of the public outreach that we'll touch on. Um, our time tonight with you is really to provide an update on the Downtown Development Authority progress. We've broken this into two parts. The first part is a review of the Downtown Matters draft downtown plan. And uh, in, your, in your packet, in your agenda, there's a uh, part one memo. It references the full draft of the plan. There's a link there, but tonight we'll just pick out some select pieces and go through those with you as, uh, as an overview. I'll also mention that uh, our last update on the DDA was actually May 19th, and then prior to that was February 19th in the old days, pre-COVID. So um, our team, I will say, has done an outstanding job working during the COVID shutdown. Uh, we had a lot of online meetings with our steering committee, with our consultant team. We had a a full-blown um, public forum online at which we had 50 uh, participants very actively engaged. Uh, so it's been, it's been quite an exercise, but I would say it actually has flourished even in the midst of uh, the COVID impacts. We had a steering committee um, that met a number of times and very successfully online. So, um, just a little bit of background. Um, I guess the recommendation to form a, a downtown development authority emerged out of the Downtown Matters Initiative, which was largely funded by Dr. Cog Next Step Study Grant that we secured last year, a $200,000 grant that involved a local match of $41,000 plus dollars. Um, on June 15th, the council initiated its, its first reading of a downtown development authority organizational ordinance, um, which they passed at first reading 5-2, and then last night uh, passed at second reading 5-2 as well. So the significance of that is it now tees up a November 3rd special election DDA election uh, for qualified electors within the DDA boundaries. So that's a, a really a huge milestone. Um, I'll just remind uh, the commission that the uh, formation of a DDA was strongly recommended in many recent uh, city-sponsored studies as well as independent studies. Uh, and as we've mentioned to you before, the uh, Inglewood DDA would enable downtown Inglewood to brand and market um, its businesses, improve and program downtown public spaces and finance needed repairs and capital projects. Um, we're reviewing tonight with you um, the downtown plan, the draft downtown plan, looking for your feedback. We're looking simultaneously for the feedback of the city council. Uh, the plan is posted for public comment 
and public review and comment through actually the now the end of July. So all of these uh, inputs will be taken into account in further revisions of the downtown plan, which you'll uh, hear an overview on from our consultants this evening. Uh, if um, I should also mention then that uh, the special election will be administered by the law firm of Spencer, F Spencer Fain, um, and uh, they'll be compensated both from the proceeds of the of the grant, as well as some um, budget dollars from the community development 2020 approved budget. Um, so that's uh, by by way of background. And in your packet, there's a memo that provides uh, a number of routes for you to provide specific feedback to the consulting team. And uh, with that, I will uh, try to share my screen and see if I can uh, get to um, an overview. And um, I'll just take you through a couple pages here and then turn it over to Hillary. So uh, what we really want to do is just highlight some specific aspects of the draft plan, give you a flavor of it, uh, and then hopefully it'll be enough for you to be encouraged to look at the complete plan and provide comments uh, to the Downtown Matters team. As mentioned, um, as mentioned, we did have a very, very good steering committee, uh, about 25 different uh, business leaders and property owners from downtown, and significantly they represented the three different sub areas that make up um, the DDA boundary area and that we're really trying to tie together as a critical aspect of the DDA strategy. So they were from the South Broadway sub area, the city center sub area, as well as the uh, Metro district sub area. I mentioned we had a really significant team, consulting team. Here they are pictured in, in addition to the ones I mentioned. Dig, Puma, and Portel Works. We had OV Consulting on mobility and transportation issues, and then Spencer Fain on legal issues. And with that, I think I will turn it over to Hillary to talk some about process and um, as well, Brad and, and Bill. Thanks, Dan. Um, and thanks for having us here tonight. Um, a whole lot has happened since we last spoke back in February on that snowy night. Um, and I, I guess I just wanna say from, from the consultant team's point of view, it's been really nice to be involved in something positive during this period of time that has been so um, scary and um, uh, a, lot of the, a lot of unknowns hitting people in downtowns across the country. And what we've been able to do here is work very directly with downtown stakeholders and put together not just a, a 20 year plan, but a real um, vision for how downtown Inglewood can become a more economically resilient and equi equitable place that benefits everyone. And it is uh, an aspirational plan and it is a strategy to move forward. In March, we pivoted and added an economic recovery section to this plan. So what could this future downtown development authority do day one, January one of, of 2021, hopefully? Um, and why would that matter to, to people who are really struggling downtown right now? So we kicked off the project in January. Um, it's been a pretty comprehensive um, multi, multi formed um, opportunity for people to participate in a way that works for them. We have sent uh, communication to about 1,000 downtown property owners and business owners. We do email updates twice a month to 600 plus uh, downtown stakeholders. We've had the project in Citizen Magazine in the winter and the spring and now the summer um, and a number of news articles, including one in the Inglewood Herald just in the last couple of days. About 320 people in the community participated in an online survey to give their feedback about what they like and don't like and what their ideas are about downtown. 180 people participated in three forums. The first one was in person 
and it was about uh, downtown trends affecting communities across the country and how they were uh, coming to affect the city of Inglewood. And then we had two online forums, one called Building Small on Main Street, which presented new strategies for small scale development that we feel might be more appropriate for parts of South Broadway and Old Hamden. And then we had a community forum um, on a Zoom format as well that had, had pretty good attendance. Um, we then moved into drafting the, the Downtown Matters Plan, and now we've got it out for public review, and it will be online through July 30th. And then um, um, the, there will be a legal process to form a DDA as we move forward. This is what the public review communications looked like. Um, the first one is a press release and an email update that went out through Downtown Matters. The Chamber has been really helpful in helping us spread information, as has the Economic Development Department. The, the graphic on the right is what the web page looks like. It's on inglewoodco.gov, uh, wait a minute. It's on the city's website, inglewoodco.gov backslash downtown matters. And we've put links to everything here. So if, if anybody has missed a forum or wants to review the Downtown Matters plan or see some of the news coverage, it's, it's all there to sort of catch up on. And uh, this is the, the new definition of, of downtown that's being presented in the draft plan. It, it encompasses the city center area, the South Broadway area, portions of it and what is called the medical district and the, the boundaries are very generally South Santa Fe to the west, Eastman Avenue to the north, Kenyon Avenue to the south and Lafayette Street to the east. Each of these sub areas um, has its own kind of character um, but they're not cohesive and there isn't a lot of economic synergy between the three. Um, they really could work together um, in a more coordinated fashion and could, you know, exude a little bit more of a, of a unified identity uh, for downtown Inglewood than they do today. There are about uh, 385 commercial properties in this area. So after all of that, that, that input and the, the forms and the mailings and the survey, um, about eight big ideas rose to the surface very quickly. And the whole plan is really built on these ideas. The first one is to create an entity that has the ability, the tools, the financing to do something um, tangible and real for downtown Inglewood. Um, the second one is to extend the vibrancy of downtown by adding more residents, jobs, and entertainment. This is all about that synergy I was talking about, having more economic activity, more social activity uh, through the day and into the evening downtown and creating a stronger customer base. What, what the downtown businesses need right now is more people around them, uh, a daytime workforce and evening time um, residential community that lives and, and works downtown. Um, the third one was to create an authentic brand identity. The next one was to cultivate street level active activation through downtown. So we have an interesting um, um, vibrant feeling when you're, when you're moving through downtown, however you choose to do that. The next one is about multimodal, um, making it easier and more accessible to get around downtown Inglewood, whether you're, you're on foot or on wheels or on, on an Uber or Lyft or you're riding your own, your own vehicle. And then the, the next one is to uh, collaborate to enhance downtown vitality. That's all about partnerships. Inglewood has a great civic infrastructure of a chamber, a historical society, the economic development department, um, the library the Downtown Museum of Outdoor Arts, all of those entities are already in place and the DDA can, can step in and start to partner with them and hopefully leverage and enhance their efforts. Safety is always a, a focus for a Downtown Development Authority. And then the last one is partnering, partnering with the private sector to promote redevelopment of catalytic sites. So a DDA can actually provide gap financing to make larger things happen. And now I'm going to hand it off to Brad Siegel. 
Thanks, Hillary, and thanks, Planning and Zoning, for inviting us into your Zoom world this evening. <laughs> um, everybody can hear me? Is that, yep, we're good. Um, so thank you for having us. I'm Brad Siegel. I'm principal of a firm called Puma. We are real estate economists and planners. We are located on uh, beautiful East Colfax in Denver. Um, I myself, I'm a Denver native. I go back to where I'm old enough, I can remember Cinderella City you know, when all this started. And um, I've had the opportunity to work on and off with Englewood over the last 15 years on several assignments related to downtown. And maybe most relevant to this work, we were the, uh, the economic development consultants on the comp plan that went through the Planning and Zoning Commission and the City Council a few years back. I'm going to introduce the plan content in terms of what is actually in downtown matters. Uh, there's a lot in there, so we'll just give you the highlights tonight. Um, the plan is a menu. It's a menu of different improvements and initiatives that downtown could opt to take over the next 5, 10, 15 years and beyond. And this plan becomes the uh, business plan, if you will, for the DDA that we're talking about. So if a downtown development authority is created, it would follow this plan and it would help implement the different projects, investments, initiatives that are outlined herein. Uh, next slide, please, Dan. So I'm gonna talk about um, a couple of these sections. Um, the first one, importantly, is about economy, jobs, and homes. And this became, um, First and foremost, as, as we, our process went into March and we suddenly had the uh, convergence of a public health and an economic crisis. So the no notion of creating jobs and bolstering the economy, supporting small businesses um, became critical and really becomes one of the imperatives of this plan and a new DDA moving forward. So priorities within this section, and, and a lot of this is based upon the community input that Hillary talked about. It's also supported by a market assessment that we worked on last year and then carried forward into this year. Um, but initiatives to fill vacant storefronts um, and to support existing small businesses, attracting reinvestment in downtown, and that gets into some of the tools that I'll talk about later that a DDA can deploy. Um, in terms of the business mix, there's a real affection for the community serving local independent businesses in Englewood and in this part of town. So there's a strong emphasis on supporting local businesses. More primary employment. We have a real sense that we could, we could bolster employment in the center city area, particularly with the proximity to transit and the, uh, the unique location that Englewood has, um, it's just, just seven, eight miles south of downtown Denver. Um, housing is part of the vision here. So we feel that there's a strong market opportunity in the near term and, and a longer term opportunity for a whole variety of housing types. So uh, market rate housing, affordable housing, workforce, live work, uh, much more housing in the center city area and in downtown. And incidentally, that new housing and that new population would also support the small businesses uh, that are also located in the area. We also touch on homeless services and uh, street populations in downtown. And we outline a number of ways where the DDA, the new Downtown Development Authority, could partner with social service organizations, uh, county mental health, other agencies uh, to help reduce homelessness on the streets in a, in a, compassionate, uh, in a compassionate way. Next slide, please. As both Dan and Hillary mentioned, uh, midway through our process, we also looked at not just long-term vision for downtown, but also near-term. How are we gonna help small businesses navigate through this unprecedented economic climate we have right now over the next six, nine, 12, 18 months? So we do have a section in the plan that talks about economic recovery. Uh, when I talk about the DDA later, uh, we are anticipating that that could be up and running by January 1, and the Downtown Development Authority could actually be piloting a number of these near-term initiatives. So marketing support for local businesses, really focusing on 
Englewood residents and, and nearby populations to support downtown uh, businesses. Uh, working on these catalytic sites in the city center area um, and also the medical district, there are a couple, several actually, project opportunities that are in motion right now. And the expectation is those will continue to develop over the next couple of years. Streetscape improvements on Old Hampton. This is something I, I recollect we worked on a project maybe 10 years ago that looked at streetscape improvements on Old Hampton for the medical district. Uh, with the DDA, we'd actually have the capacity to finance some of these improvements and, and help redesign those. Uh, activate vacant storefronts. Unfortunately, there will be likely going to be some more vacancies um, if we're going through COVID for another six, nine, 12 months. But optimistically, we see a surge of entrepreneurship on the other side of this, on the other side of the pandemic. And the DDA could partner with Englewood to help uh, work with property owners to fill any storefronts that are vacant. Uh, brand identity and marketing, really creating a strong identity and a destination appeal for downtown. Um, and then new business uh, attraction. And there have been some pretty exciting new businesses that have announced movement to, uh, to Englewood. Uh, the CEO of Core Consulting is on our steering committee. They're a 60 employee firm that is currently right now moving from Littleton to Englewood. Attracted, uh, they've, they've testified they've attracted because of the unique character in South Broadway and the small businesses that are already there. Next slide, please. Marketing and programming um, also goes with this. So um, this brand identity that I talked about, marketing programs, the DDA will be able to undertake marketing day one. So if the DDA is formed in November, along with it will be a mill levy of two mills. I'll explain that a little bit more later, but that'll offer funding. So a lot of these marketing and branding initiatives could happen immediately, first quarter of next year. Um, downtown events, which obviously are not gonna be near term, but we hope that uh, hopefully by this time next year, and we all have uh, been vaccinated and, and we're all happy <laughs> and healthy and confident that we'll be gathering for downtown events, but there'll be the opportunity for small scale events to, uh, to ramp those up in the interim and communicating with ratepayers. So at this point, I'm gonna hand off to uh, Bill Vitek, who is the lead consultant in this, in this group, and he will focus on uh, public spaces and the built environment. Thanks, Brad, and good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us as well. Um, and like Brad, you know, downtown Inglewood is kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, I don't live uh, very far from downtown Inglewood. Frequent many of the restaurants um, on Old Hamden in, in the downtown area. And uh, in fact, a couple times a week, usually ride my bike through downtown Inglewood on my way to the Platte River Trail and the, the commute to downtown Denver where our office is. So uh, I've got a really good sense over the years of um, how it's evolved and the opportunities that I think um, present themselves. And in particular, as Brad said, I want to focus on the public spaces and the, the physical, the placemaking aspect and goals of the plan. And um, with, with the public spaces, when we refer to that, we, what we're really um, uh, kind of referencing are the streetscapes, the parks, the plazas. And there is kind of a, a structure of some great opportunities with the bike trail that kind of comes right to downtown. and. I think connectivity through downtown, we'll talk about that in a minute, but you know, there's some good bones, but I think there's a lot of opportunity to help enhance those even further. And one of the most important things for any successful downtown uh, really is an imperative to have a sense of being clean and safe. And uh, the DDA can play a very key role in that. Uh, also to improve the existing public uh, spaces, again, the plazas, the paseos, the park that's uh, downtown there by uh, Broadway and Hamden. Um, the, um, the, again, lots of opportunity to improve those and the DDA can play that role. Um, improve the pedestrian experience. You know, people are willing to walk. One of the key things that we heard from our surveys, from our uh, stakeholder groups, as well as the public comments as well, when we do those kind of word cloud exercises, one of the key themes that read through loud and clear from everybody was this idea of walkability. So the importance of shade, the importance of sidewalks, the importance of, of 
interesting storefronts, those types of things that, that really engages at the pedestrian level. So um, again, we uh, will plan talks at a very um, conceptual level as some ideas of how to improve those. Uh, and then really enhance um, some of the local, unique local identity that Englewood has going for it. Um, I think it does have a very rich collection of local entrepreneurial, you know, non-chain restaurants, uh, both on Old South Broadway and, um, I'm sorry, South Broadway and Old Hamden, that I really think are uh, kind of, again, those attractors that, um, as Hillary said earlier, that, you know, attracts workers during the day and, and can uh, really thrive from uh, close by residential neighborhoods as, at night. So continue to build on all the, the strengths that England has going. On the um, land use and urban design front, so something very near and dear to your heart, um, you know, I think one of the overall themes is to focus development in the downtown core. And what we mean by that is to, you know, don't let development scatter out north or south and east and west when it, in terms of that type of development that helps support um, active use and activation in, the, in, the, in these three sub areas that we're referring to now as downtown. Um, identify catalytic sites for redevelopment. Again, Brad mentioned a minute ago about uh, the opportunities, particularly in the city center area. Um, we think there's lots of potential for uh, more residential within that area. And residential is catalytic um, synergy with uh, retail and office. Um, so that's um, some, some great sites and opportunities there for that. Um, mentioned a minute ago about encouraging uh, walkable compact development. So imagine a place and we think Englewood could very easily be, downtown Englewood could very easily be this kind of place where you don't need a car. You know, you could get on your bike and go downtown or you can get on your bike and go south to um, Sheffield or you can, you know, ride RTD. We do, we do think mass transit will come back again once, once we get a vaccine and, and uh, people feel safe. But it really has a lot of strategic advantage uh, in terms of its location from its mobility opportunities and its walkability aspects. And then expand the mix of uses. Um, by that we mean, you know, think about more residential, think about the retail synergies, think about places where um, people work. I mean, we're, the site is really fortunate to be so close to the largest employer of all of Englewood with Swedish and um, and uh, Cray hospitals being uh, a part of the, kind of the downtown identity now. And then as we've seen in many successful um, buildings already, you know, encourage the adaptive reuse of existing structures uh, within the downtown area. Great examples like Kachino Taco, um, Grow and Gather, you know, those types of of um, entrepreneurial type of businesses that work with that existing fabric, which we think is very kind of uniquely Englewood in terms of its scale and um, they look for ways to leverage that. And then lastly, uh, next slide Dan, um, you know, it plays a, such an important part of urban design is, is how everything is connected. So mobility and transportation, how we strengthen the connections between the three sub areas that are now known as downtown which has, um, again, you know, employment, it has retail, it has transportation, it has civic functions. Um, we think that improving the trolley service in terms of its identity, as well as its frequency of service, and maybe even a different type of lower entry vehicle could have a lot of, of um, advantages for connection, connectivity. Um, and then a well-connected downtown, you know, is, is really means multimodal. Um, so, really leveraging, again, the RTD station, uh, the connections to the trail. That's one thing we heard from uh, the folks at CORE was what was so appealing to downtown Englewood was the, the rail stop, the Platte River Trail, and the ability for um, adequate parking. And managing that parking, um, we think one of the key outcomes of the plan can be uh, greater uh, wayfinding and signage program to direct people uh, not only if they, um, they're they visiting, they're working, they're coming down for dinner. Um, we think there's, there's there's ample parking. It's just a matter of getting people to, lo to locate it and properly tap into it. So those are the um, kind of, from the physical place making transportation, some of the key goals of the overall plan. And I'm gonna hand it back over to you now, Brad. Thanks, Dan. 
So I'll talk uh, briefly about the Downtown Development Authority. And, and this is maybe the piece that makes this plan very different from many plans that you may have had the opportunity to review in the past through planning and zoning. And, and the reason why this is different, it, it actually becomes a, an opportunity to implement these things. This, this becomes a, an entity, a champion for downtown that can generate resources to carry out many of these ideas and improve uh, all these improvements to the public realm that Bill was talking about, the marketing, the business support. We really see the Downtown Development Authority as, as that entity that every day would, would focus on downtown and how to improve it. So we looked at a variety of DDAs up and down the Front Range. Uh, there were site visits to Longmont, to uh, Castle Rock, which have had DDAs, Longmont for 30 years. Castle Rock for, oh, I think 12 years now. Other successful DDAs up and down the Front Range include Fort Collins downtown, owes a lot of its resurgence to, uh, to its downtown development authority. But what it is, it's a quasi-public uh, entity, steward, champion for downtown. It focuses on vitality and attractiveness of downtown. That's really its mission. Um, to form the DDA, and Dan mentioned this notion of a an election in November, it does require a vote of electors within the boundaries of the DDA. So this is not a citywide vote, but within those boundaries that Hillary uh, showed earlier, uh, property owners, businesses, any residents within those boundaries would be able to vote this November on whether they want the DDA or not. And they'll be voting on both creating it and also funding the DDA. Uh, once it's created, it has uh, a board of directors. Those board members, like you, are appointed by council. So city council would appoint the, uh, the board members of the DDA. Uh, we're recommending a seven member board, which is um, fairly typical of, of the DDAs up and down the front range. Uh, we're recommending representation from those different districts. So city center, South Broadway, medical district, Make sure there's small businesses, some of the larger stakeholders, and a variety of different uh, property and, and business types represented on that board. And then there are two funding tools. Uh, one is, is a mill levy that's just within the boundaries of the DDA, and also tax increment financing. So the mill levy, current property taxes in this part of Englewood and downtown are uh, about 73 mills. We're proposing in year one that we would add two mills to that. That two mills would be exclusively for the DDA. Um, we're recommending, you can go up to five under the state statute, but we're acknowledging the, uh, the economic times right now, tough times and the uh, uh, being conservative in terms of the type of tax burden that any business could take on right now. We did do some scenarios on some businesses in downtown and Hillary can correct me if I'm wrong on my recollection here, but my recollection is a small storefront of a couple thousand square feet. I believe it's about $80 a year was the, uh, the tax impact. We looked at a restaurant that was larger, newer, higher value, about 5,000 square feet. My recollection is the uh, tax impact was about 550, 570, I believe was the tax impact. Um, for a large player like, uh, Swedish hospital, it's, it's fairly significant. It's a five digit number. Um, we have talked to them, they are supportive, um, but we do think starting with the two mills is uh, that it's getting that balance between not creating a burden for the businesses, but also creating enough money where we can actually start doing some things January 1 to promote downtown and help the businesses out. The other tool with the DDA is tax increment financing. Uh, many of you may be familiar already with tax increment. It's, it's common in, um, in urban renewal, which, which you already have in Englewood. But what tax increment financing is, it's not an increase in anybody's taxes, but it's a reallocation of future increases in taxes. So if sales taxes increase, if we create new retail, or if property values increase, if there's new development, the, uh, the increment or the addition over the the base could be reinvested within the district. So it's a tool that's used commonly. There are, um, gosh, scores 
probably more than 100 tax increment districts throughout the state. Um, Denver has uh, probably 30 of these just in Denver alone. So tax increment financing is one of the tools that would be used uh, by the DDA. And then lastly, this plan that we walked through, that, as I mentioned earlier, that really is the business plan for the DDA. And it really can't stray from that. It's, its initiatives and its investments need to be consistent with this plan. Um, I think the next slide goes to Hillary, and I think we're just about ready to close. Um, during the public review plan, the, the period, the draft plan is being posted online from June 15th through July 30th. We have, have extended that. Um, we're providing a printed copy of the plan for anybody who wants to request one. Um, any comments or questions can, can be directed to info at inglewooddowntownmatters.com. And that goes directly to me where I log the comments make sure that they're organized for the consultant team and answer any questions or comments can be uh, sent or, or delivered to the development, excuse me, the Department of Community Development um, at the city offices. And with that, Mike, uh, if you, you know, we'd be happy to entertain any questions on this portion of the update. Okay, excellent. With that, we certainly appreciate the uh, presentation. Would anybody have any questions? Anything at all? Carl. Uh, Ms. Townley has a question. She raised her hand. Uh, I'd already called on Carl. Oh, I apologize. Thank you. Uh, the uh, the one one thing I was wondering about was the how many residential uh, properties are within the boundaries. Uh, yes, there are there are a number of residential properties, and uh, without going into too much detail, I'll just say that uh, basically. Uh, some of the older multifamily apartment buildings that happen to sit on commercial, commercially zoned property are included because they will eventually be redeveloped. And so it's appropriate that they be in the district. Uh, single family homes generally are totally excluded. The exception there is that if there are um, rental single family homes that happen to sit again on um, commercially zoned lots, they are included and there are about 38 of those. But any owner occupied single family um, are specifically excluded. Carl, could you unmute? Uh a lot, lot of the things that you uh, described in there are, sounds really good, and but uh, you're, you're talking about two percent now versus five percent. I'm kind of looking at the five percent as being enough to cover most of it. Two percent is not is going to be you know less than half of that. So what is that going to cover? I mean, I, I, that's a general question, but. Uh, not sure how what you're going to get for two percent. Sure, the um, I, I believe what you're referring to is the uh, somewhat. Yeah, there, if folks could mute their um, microphones because we're getting some feedback. Um, I think what you're referring to is the proposed mill levy, uh, two mills versus five mills, and um, the two mills generates about a little over two hundred and. Uh, about $250,000 a year. And one reason, the primary reason that we're being conservative with the mill levy in year one is because of the economic climate we're in. We're, we're in a really tough economic climate, certainly for the next year or so. Uh, the, the DDA will have the ability to raise that mill levy up to five mills. Uh, that is being provided for in the, um, in the proposed uh, election language. 
the five mills could raise substantially more, could raise about $600,000 a year. Uh, but what we're anticipating is that that would be raised gradually as the economic conditions improve. If, if it was 2019, we'd be recommending five mills. Uh, 2020, uh, not so much. So we're hoping by 21, 22, particularly 22, things will recover and that, that mill levy can increase. Um, Dan, would you add anything to that? I would, I would just add that as the uh, DDA proceeds, a lot of the financial strength is really tied to the TIF financing that comes out of it, because that's where the, the ability to finance larger improvements uh, comes from. So the, um, the mill levy is really for operational maintenance, promotion, marketing type tasks, other than the TIF generated financing deals with some of the bigger improvements and some of the bigger programs of the DDA. Okay, excellent. Kate, you had a question. Thanks. Um, so if I'm understanding correctly, the uh, TIF part is based on sales tax increment, whereas the mill levy is based on the property tax um, assessed. And the, so we're also gonna have a ballot measure on repealing the Gallagher Amendment. So um, I'm wondering how that would impact um, commercial rates and how that would impact then the mill levy. Brad, do you wanna take that? Yeah, that's a really good question. Because um, that Gallagher vote in November is going to be pretty important. Um, I assume everyone understands that the Gallagher Amendment has, for what, 30 years in Colorado, 40 years now, has created a, um, a maximum by which residential property taxes can't raise uh, beyond a certain amount. And what that's done over time is it's, it's created more burden on commercial and, and less on residential. As I understand the ballot initiative, it's going to uh, eliminate Gallagher, but it's gonna freeze the residential rates where they are. So residential taxes won't go up. But over time, and to your question, over time that'll allow commercial taxes actually to come down a little bit. So um, Gallagher, um, should provide some relief, not in the initial year or two, but down the road, it should provide a little bit more relief for commercial property owners, which may be another rationale and another reason for increasing that, that two mil um, in, in subsequent years as well, because there'll be less burden on those commercial property owners. The other thing I want to clarify on the TIF is uh, you actually can utilize both, both uh, increase increment in sales tax and increase increment in property values as well. So a big distinction though, and this, this gets, you get all this sort of tax stuff going on, but the big difference is that the mill levy is an addition. That's an addition on top of their existing tax. The tax increment financing, the TIF, is just reallocating future, in, future increases from value and sales. So you're not increasing anybody's tax per se, but you're being able to capture those future increases and invest them right in downtown. And to Dan's point earlier, that's why the TIF can be a powerful tool down the road. Okay, thank you. Okay. Excellent, any other questions, concerns, clarifying points? Colin, yes. welcome to the party. Yeah, thank you, Jeffrey Meyer. Um, I know one of the challenges that we've had um, with these areas is actually getting money from the hospitals. Um, you know, they're, I believe, um, tax free um, in some way, shape or form. How, I know they're seeing their support above it, but how do we actually, you know, that's going to be a big chunk of where this money's coming from, at least initially. How do we make sure that happens? How do we get that um, to, you know, be a part of this? Of, of this? That's a, that is a great question. We have worked very hard over the last couple of years to really engage the hospitals and kind of draw them out of their historical shells. You know, they've gotten so used to kind of operating on their own little island over there that uh, it's been a challenge, you know, uh, but they generally 
uh, understand they need to participate in community development efforts. They need to collaborate with their host cities. And we've made some good progress. Uh, both hospitals sit on the steering committee. Uh, just in the last couple of weeks, Swedish has assured us that they are committed to participating in the DDA. Uh, their annual mill levy portion will amount to something like $68,000. And then their future TIF from future projects will be very significant. They pay about $2.4 million in property taxes right now. So uh, just getting them to uh, getting them to where we have them now is, uh, is big progress. Craig is a nonprofit, so we're going to have to collaborate with them in different ways, but they are very uh, enthusiastic about the DDA, and I think ultimately we will find some ways for them to participate and bring value to the table, even though it won't be through, um, through property taxes or, or mill levy per se. Uh, I think there's a lot that they can lend to the DDA in terms of energy and other resources. So good question. Uh, any other questions? Yes, Noel. Um, on one of the slides, uh, you went over providing gap financing to businesses. Um, can you describe what that would look like and when it would be used? Sure, there, there were actually some great examples right now um, going on with the pandemic. And um, I mean, poor Dan, every other week I send him an email from Colorado Springs, but the Colorado Springs Downtown Development Authority has been up and running for, I think about 10 years. And they have a couple initiatives. They have a, uh, they have a revolving loan fund that small businesses and property owners can tap into. That revolving loan fund is largely capitalized from uh, TIF that, that we were talking about. And then with the pandemic, they, were, they generated about $300,000 in emergency grants. And they wrote their own rules on this. They, they said it has to be a storefront, it has to be uh, community serving, preferred uh, local ownership, and they were able to direct a fairly substantial amount of emergency grants to small businesses. So I, I pull that out as, as an example, but certainly the DDA will have that flexibility. And in all our, of our other examples, Longmont, Castle Rock, Fort Collins, uh, they've all invested in either revolving loan funds or uh, facade loans, sometimes small grants. Um, and that's all fair game. Okay, any other questions, Diane? I thought I saw you put your hand up. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I have a, I have a couple of questions, so I'll just go one by one. They were in order of the presentation, but the first one is, um, I think for Hillary, do you feel you had a majority of the um, qualified elector, electorate constituents involved in all of these? In essence, I'm asking, do you feel like a majority of the qualified electorates are, are on board with this? Can't hear you. Sorry about that. Um, I think we have enough traction with the, the, the downtown champions um, stakeholders from both hospitals, from South Broadway, from the city center area, uh, both the larger developers, larger employers, new employers to the area, longtime business owners um, in Inglewood, um, where they're all saying we should move forward. We, we like what we see. We need a path out of this and we need a long-term uh, plan and strategy and an entity with the wherewithal to implement. So um, now we go into um, even more community education with the downtown stakeholders specifically for the next several months leading up to the Tabor election. So we anticipate um, quite a bit of interface with 
downtown property owners and business owners and um, you know, more forums, more Q's and A's, more information on the website that is specific to what it means to them as, as a downtown stakeholder. Great, thank you. Um, for my next question, I, I am curious how the DDA would decide the order of projects that would be executed. I know that you said there would be a board appointed by council. Would the board choose or would it, would they sort of recommend and then there's an election amongst the constituents? So that's a really good setup for the second part of our presentation tonight, because uh, the DA board, it's, it's got, it's got certain powers and then it doesn't. So the mill levy that we were talking about, the DDA board can pretty much decide from year to year how to spend the two, three, four, five hundred thousand for marketing and operations. The tax increment financing is trickier. So, um, and it, it usually requires council action um, in addition to the DDA board. So um, let's say there's a project that the DDA wants to invest in. And let's say, um, I love your assistant there, by the way. Um, let's say, <laughs> she can't, she'll come in from time to time. I, I have the door closed, but it doesn't really work. She's great. She's wonderful. Keep her there. Um, anyway, um, I'm, I'm having flashbacks. Mine are much older, so I cherish these moments. Anyway, um, on the TIF, it's, it's a little more complicated because uh, with TIF, Oftentimes, we'll want to use that tax increment to issue bonds. You have the ability to issue bonds with that. And the bonds have to get the stamp of approval from city council, and the DDA board just can't go out and issue its own bonds. So that becomes sort of an accountability. There's, there's accountability on the big stuff with council, and then the smaller stuff, the operational stuff, the DDA has more latitude. Dan, would you, would you clarify or add to any of that? No, I think that's right. And uh, we'll try to give you a summary of the DDA ordinance and some of the projects, um, hypothetical projects that we discussed with city council. And you can see how they're kind of spread over the DDA and, and prioritized uh, based on time. Thank you. Yeah, I, I was sort of referencing the document that we got as well. Thank you for that explanation. And my last question is just, it's maybe it's, maybe it's actually a question for the city, but one of the slides kind of poked my mind on it. Um, with regards to adaptive reuse and promoting that, are there special incentives either at the city or the DDA level that would promote that? Or is that just sort of a, you know, a goal? I think generally it's an aspirational goal, uh, although, you know, we have uh, been very uh, conscious about the way that we're looking at uh, build small um, along particularly Broadway and Hampton. So we have a really nice opportunity where we have a couple traditional, you know, retail small business corridors that we'd like to leave in place and take advantage of them. But then we have this large you know, kind of super block redevelopment city center, uh, which we'd like to see redeveloped and become much more of a vibrant place than it is. So we think the two can really coexist um, with different types of development that complement each other. And so there, I, I think there's no need for the redevelopment orientation of city center to do away with the smaller scale of both Broadway and Hampton. Yeah, I think to just a reminder that the downtown plan is a 20 year kind of policy document. The DDA from a, from a year to year basis will have its own operational plan. And it may be that um, investing in incentives or policy modifications to encourage adaptive reuse in specific areas becomes part of their operational plan. Thank you, that's all. Okay, any other questions from anybody? Yes, Judy. 
Um, I'm trying to understand the housing portion of it. So if we're talking, so I have two questions related to that. One is if housing isn't in, really included in the DDA unless it's multifamily for rent, is that correct? Then the incentive is not going to be for owner occupancy located in the DDA. So I don't, I guess I don't understand how the DDA helps with housing. Um, we already, you know, owner occupancy of our stuff is an issue. So that's that that's a conversation for another one. But I'm trying to understand how the DDA can support housing when it's not going to be incentivized to support housing, if I'm understanding it correctly. Um, and then um, for that, I know that, and this may not be related, but there's in the redevelopment, um, I believe there's still talk of a hotel, correct? Um, and then that would be part of the DDA as well, correct? Correct. Brad, uh, the housing probably is a good question for you. Yeah, the, the plan does include supporting housing. And um, we, in the plan, we talk about supporting a variety of housing types. So um, it, that includes rental, includes owner occupied, includes market rate, includes affordable. Um, and honestly, I think this plan says the more the merrier on, on more people living particularly in the center city area, so, um, or city center area. So um, the, the plan is supportive of housing. And um, if there were amenities that needed subsidy for housing, maybe it's, it's better streets or streetlights or landscaping or public improvements or a whole variety of things, uh, the DDA could help finance those kinds of things and, and help create a better neighborhood. So um, we do see housing as a big part of the vision and, and um, we see housing having a double benefit of helping support the small businesses too. If, if there were uh, hundreds, maybe a couple thousand people living in there, uh, that would be great for the small businesses on South Broadway, it would really help. And the last thing I'll say is it just begs for it being so close to transit. Um, that transit will be used again. We, we will all feel safe once again in the future <laughs> on a bus or a train. So uh, to have people living right next to the train station just makes all the sense in the world. And the final thing I'll say, I keep saying the final thing, but new thoughts keep coming in. Uh, the hospitals, this is important to them too. Um, they, they would love to have attainable housing for their employees. So for nurses and, and for their, their workforce, to have their workforce just walk to work um, would be huge for them. They're really supportive of the housing. Well, I, I guess I'm still not clear on uh, if it's if it's an owner occupied rental, they would not be a member of the DDA. Only people that the only type of housing that could help the DDA financially would be multifamily multifamily for rent. So that's ultimately the only type of housing that sort of gets incentivized. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I just, that's not yeah, a variety I, of housing. Well, well, we'll help you with that a little bit because, and Dan, help me if I'm wrong here, but um, the, the DDA boundary is really being drawn to try to uh, not disrupt your existing neighborhoods around downtown because the existing neighborhoods are so strong. But if it's in the boundary, and it's built, if there's owner occupied condos within the boundary of the DDA and it's new construction, it'll be included in the DDA. But the so current owner occupied residential is not. Only, only, a, only a couple dozen units that are on commercially zoned land. So there's, uh. so the, there's single family neighborhoods around this area and they were pretty clear in telling us, this is great, but don't mess us up. Okay. <laughs> so th there was intention in drawing those boundaries. Thank you. Any other questions from anybody? Yes, Carl. 
Uh, as far as the uh, projects that will be done, uh, who determines who de gets the contract for those uh, projects? How, how is that determined? Yeah, I would just say that the board, there's a lot of vetting uh, at the DDA board level other than at the city council level in terms of how uh, TIF funded financing is made available to help subsidize various projects. And again, um, it's all gonna be in accordance with the adopted downtown plan that's going to set the priorities um, for what the DDA does. So that will become the business plan that really uh, puts some guardrails around um, the subsidies offered by the DDA. One, one other question. I see a couple of parking structures on your uh, potential um, area improvements map. Uh, one thing that uh, I'd like to throw this out there, it's always bothered me. The parking structure, they're not structure, but the parking lot on the east side of uh, the, between uh, Broadway and Oma, that that parking lot is a mess back there. There's cables all over the place. There's probably a half a dozen grease traps back there. There's a dozen dumpsters back there. Right now, there's a food truck parked back there that has weeds growing about two feet tall under it. Uh, the, the asphalt is a mess. But that's an ideal spot for parking for downtown. Ideal spot. And I, I'd like to see that uh, part of the plan. And if that parking lot could be improved, that's going to help parking tremendously down there. Yeah, I would say all the, all those things fall into the jurisdiction of the DDA in terms of working with property owners, uh, creating a, a parking plan, uh, evaluating parking over time. All those things that just aren't being done today because there's no entity to do those and um, so the DDA can really move uh, effectively in that area of parking. Yeah, and in particular you raise a good point. Um, in doing our analysis there does seem to be you know a good reservoir of parking but so many people can't locate the parking so a signage and wayfinding program that can help direct people to the locations that um, where parking is available is something the DDA can definitely take on right away. And there were also some concerns about safety. If I'm, if I'm thinking of the same parking lot Carl is mentioning, um, some female business owners said their, their customers felt, especially women felt unsafe walking through the paseo um, into the parking lot where the, the lighting is not uh, very sufficient and it made them feel uneasy. So, you know, lighting, um, cleanliness, the maintenance, all of that stuff works together um, to make those public amenities, you know, heavily used by people. The, uh, the light poles down there, they, they look like they're ready to fall over. The last time I was down there, I was at, at night, I wa started walking into the alley and, uh, and a rat ran right, in front of, right across the street and the alley in front of me, ran over to the dumpster. I mean, it, it's, it's a mess back there. Lighting is terrible. And it's an excellent spot. It's a very good spot. The, the, you look at all the, the power lines up there, they're probably 120 years old, seems like. That, that's really a, needs a lot of work, but it would be very handy to have. Well, um, Carl, one of the things that um, Dig Studio identified was that a lot of the public spaces downtown do kind of need to be refreshed. They need to be looked at with a new lens around safety and gathering and equity and maintenance. Um, and you know, the city just has very limited resources and it can't, it can't focus at that granular, granular level 
in, in the way that an entity specifically dedicated to the downtown area can. Yep. Well, it certainly makes makes a lot of sense. Um, Carl, I'm, I'm sorry. Did, did you have any other questions? Uh, not really. Uh, let's see. Uh, some, some of the outdoor seating down there that uh, because of the virus nowadays, it's, uh, it's pretty nice to actually have that down there. Uh, the, the Grand and uh, one, one Barrel has seating outside and uh, Breakfast Queen has seating in the back and that they actually put a couple of plants out in the alley back there and that, that almost looks uh, presentable. But, uh, there's a lot of things that can be done down there, a lot of things. Yeah, you know, the, there's always some opportunity in the midst of crisis and one of them is this, communities really are trying some new things out. And, you know, what does it look like and feel like to have more outdoor dining, um, you know, in, in the downtown area and having, having more people out and about generally feeling safe and, and socializing in smaller outdoor spaces. So maybe some of those things carry on long term and they become a little bit more permanent. Maybe they don't, but either way, things are learned. Right. Certainly appreciate. Right. Could I get one more in there? Sure. Go ahead. On the uh, the potential um, area improvements map, it, it has a bridge going across Santa Fe. Uh, I don't really understand what that would be for. Is that uh, an actual thing that uh, is a possibility to build? And when it goes nowhere. There's, there's a, on the other side of Santa Fe, there's a muffler shop over there, but uh, I don't see the use of building a bridge for that. I, I, would, I would just say that's a, a hypothetical project that represented a later stage of, um, of DDA expenditure. I wouldn't read too much into it, although there uh, have been a number of uh, planning efforts in the past that have looked at Brad uh, bridging Santa Fe, much like was done with the Highlands in lower downtown Denver. But yeah. I, it's so far out that I don't think you need to worry about it. It's just a placeholder for the financial analysis. And I think it also takes into consideration the potential reuse of properties there in the long term. I mean, I can remember where the apartments are right now, and that used to be a drive in movie theater um, at. Uh, Santa Fe and Hamden. And um, now there's, you know, there's quite a few residential units there. And if you think about that type of future redevelopment, and as Dan says, in the very long, long term, it really is the, the, the notion there is to make connectivity to the light rail station. Because currently right now, um, when we talk about transit-oriented development, we talk about the radius around it. But Santa Fe is such a barrier that it really is only orienting kind of east, um, north, and south, but not west at all relative to uh, the opportunities for um, maybe current residents as well as future residents to access that. So um, just a more of a long-term planning vision that um, if downtown, as we define it now, is successful, will help even drive further opportunities in the long run. Okay. Any other questions from anybody? Okay, I just I just have one, and I'm when it comes to TIF financing in the state of Colorado, is there a requirement that both uh, on each individual TIF project um, that each uh, school district or the school district have to sign off on each project as well as the county? Is that is that a, a thing here, or or not? Brad, do you want to take that? Yeah, so <clears throat> there's some nuance in the law. So it's, it's definitely a thing and a requirement for urban renewal. Uh, it's not necessarily a legal requirement for a DDA. However, um, practically, uh, practically, we'll be looking project by project at the impacts on the schools. So if there's residential, it would be 
it would make sense to share some of that revenue with the schools if you're gonna create demand on the schools. I should also mention we've had, um, we've had school representation in our steering committee and um, uh, council members have brought up school, um, the, the school issue, same issue you just brought up throughout our process. So we're conscious of it and we talk about it in the plan that, that if the project is gonna create uh, a demand on schools, if it's gonna, then, it, then there should be some revenue consideration with the schools. Okay, certainly appreciate that because having, having been involved elsewhere um, with a number of TIF projects, we, had, we got pretty creative on rebate programs, on hold the increment for a period, et cetera, et cetera, refund, you know, go towards, et cetera. So it, it just gets, gets interesting, but I'm sure all this can be worked out uh, at a later date and the details are all there. Dan, what are we missing that we need to know or what action items would you like for us to take this evening? Yeah, I would say it would be my suggestion, Mike, that instead of going into the level of detail that uh, we thought about for part two, which was really the downtown development ordinance itself, let me maybe just highlight that for you a little bit, highlight the conversation that we had with city council and the materials that we put together to uh, assist their consideration of the ordinance and the Tabor questions that are uh, part of the election and see if that kind of covers things for now. And, you know, we'll be back uh, in front of you as this continues to unfold. I just did want to mention on the downtown plan you know, with your input, with input from the council and public, that will continue to be refined. Um, and then once the DDA, if the election is successful and the DDA board is installed by the council as early as, um, as December, then the DDA board would pass on a recommended uh, downtown plan. <laughs> that downtown plan would then come to you guys uh, planning and zoning for review and recommendations uh, on the plan. So it could be further revised at that point. Then you would hopefully recommend it on to city council. City council would hold a public hearing and ultimately a final vote on the downtown plan. So you have some uh, very important uh, involvement in the later stages of the DDA formation. Okay. So for, for tonight, then, basically what you'd like to do is to finish up by giving a brief overview of what's going to be presented. If there's some top-level questions, then we'd go from there, and then we'd consider ourselves briefed at this point, and you'd also have feedback. Is that correct? I think that'd be good. Yeah, I don't think we need to necessarily go into the level of detail on part two, and there was a, a PowerPoint connected with that, that we also uh, spent quite a bit of time reviewing with council, but I think I can summarize uh, the purposes that were served by that. Okay, excellent. Floor is yours, sir. Okay, thank you. I did mention that the DDA was approved uh, on a five to two vote at second reading last night by council. Um, the, um, it, it was, it's a complicated ordinance because the uh, ordinance basically approves the special election. The first question in the special election for the voters is, do you want to approve a, a DDA? That's provided in section five of the ordinance. And then follows that are the three Tabor questions. And I, um, I have a new appreciation for how Tabor has kind of stymied um, what many Colorado communities have tried to do because it, it makes these questions be framed in the absolute worst possible way um, for the electorate. And now we're going to have to face this. We've fortunately uh, gotten counsel to understand that, but we're going to have to face this with the qualified electors in the district. There's a total uh, of about 1,800 of them. We think actually at the end of the day, only several hundred will actually vote. Those will primarily be the property owners, but we need to have a very proactive uh, outreach that will deal primarily with the Tabor questions. 
let me just summarize those for you. In section six, it's a pretty easy one. It's basically deals with the DDA's authority to collect and retain and expand its legally available revenues. So that's pretty much of a boilerplate question. Uh, section eight has some detail to it. We've talked about it here. It's the ability of the DDA to impose a mill levy within the DDA boundaries. We specifically limited that to two mills in the first year for a total of a $250,000 collection. So that seems pretty reasonable, although you know, then there's some question about how that could be increased in subsequent years. The tough one is really the middle uh, Tabor question, it's section seven. And basically it requires the ballot question to ask the electors to approve an increase in city debt related to the DDA TIF financing. And uh, that's difficult because in some respects, in, in technically speaking, the DDA TIF financing is not city debt. It does not count against the city's uh, debt capacity or against its uh, credit rating. But here it is, it's, it's being asked, it's being phrased as though the city is taking on this additional debt. So it's troubling, obviously, to city council. It's troubling to the public, but we're gonna have to basically explain uh, our way through this. So. We went through a number of scenarios with uh, city council. We started out with a range of debt increase authorization that ran all the way between $40 million and $150 million. And um, those sound like very large dollars, especially if you're thinking about them as city debt. But when you keep in mind the fact that it's not city debt, it's TIF, tax increment financing, that's um, the, the entire risk of that is on the increasing values of properties within the area and the bondholders evaluation of that investment value. Um, but we worked through a number of scenarios with city council. Ultimately, they uh, settled on an $80 million number there, uh, which is a very doable number that would allow the DDA to finance a number of rounds of significant uh, financing and uh, for public improvement projects. And we looked at a parking garage in city center. We looked at improvements to Little Dry Creek, both the creek areas and the plazas uh, at Broadway and Hampton. Uh, we looked at uh, improvements on Old Hampton and the Broadway corridor, the Paseos, uh, facade improvements, etc and figured $80 million was a pretty nice doable number. Um, one of the things that also tempers that is that the second question in the ballot language referred to in section seven is that you have to specify the total debt um, capacity, including interest uh, associated with that debt over the entire 30 year period of the DDA. It's kind of like what we all go through when we put a loan on our on our home and we, you know, that somewhere there's a disclosure that basically tells you what you're gonna be, your total liability is over the next 30 years. And it's mind blowing usually. And so same thing here, that $80 million liability of the DDA related to TIF financing has a corresponding, corresponding total a liability of $216,500,000. So that's the second blank that gets filled in in that section um, seven ballot language. Um, council ultimately understood that. They understood the $80 million. And so those are the numbers that got plugged into the final versions of the DDA organizational ordinance. Uh, we went through, as, as some of you have seen in the PowerPoint, we went through then kind of a exercising, a exercise of looking at what different amounts of the debt authorization could finance. And I think council ultimately realized that for the DEA to be successful, that debt increase authorization was gonna have to cover several rounds of public improvements. 
Uh, so that's where we ended up with it. And I think it was uh, a very, very positive dialogue. Uh, I laid the groundwork for a very extensive, I think, public outreach now in terms of uh, informing the public, uh, all of what I've explained here, how there's a really nominal risk, nominal debt increase uh, per se. And um, so I think we are moving from uh, this, this effort of drafting the downtown plan and drafting the ordinance, working with council to get it approved and really moving over the next few months into election education mode and uh, working with our team to educate the public on um, how this whole thing works. So I think in, a, in kind of an overview, uh, that's, that's an overview of the ordinance. It, it's really one formational question on the DDA followed by three uh, tougher Tabor questions that will need to be explained in, in quite a bit of detail. And so that's, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay. Again, understanding we're not going to get into the weeds of the exact language of what the council looked at in detail um, over, I'm sure, uh, an extended period of time and voted on last night. But is there a, a higher level uh, uh, question? Yes, Colin. I, I know in the, um, the flood district recently, D. Bruce um, went through their chamber process to get their mill levy uh, reinstalled and stated they couldn't go through, they couldn't. Um, do the outreach themselves. Is there any consideration or any challenge that we have with doing um, the actual uh, education of, of the public and, and how do we make sure that we do that the right way? Good question. Under the Colorado Fair Campaign Practices Act, we are limited in uh, not being able to do proactive advocacy. As representatives of the city, we cannot, you know, advocate that you should vote on this. All we can really do is educate. Uh, I, I, we don't feel that that's too much of a burden because we think we have a pretty strong case that the DDA has a pretty strong case for why it should be in place in Inglewood and you know how we're handicapped as a downtown by not having it. But we, we're not gonna be able to advocate in terms of you should vote this way. Uh, the, um, there will be an effort to fill the gap in terms of some private sector sponsorship that can hire one or more consultants who could help advocate in a coordinated effort with the educational team sponsored under the grant and by the city. And that's, we're just now starting to turn our attention to that to figure out how that might work and whether in fact we can find some private sector sponsors to um, you know, help with some true advocacy. Okay. Is that, okay, Michelle. Um, I'm assuming that like the city of Longmont and the other cities in the very beginning of your presentation use the same sort of financing. Is that correct? Yes, they have used it over time, both the, both the mill levy and the TIF. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and in their experience, did they have, I mean, I understand that the city can't get involved with the um, campaign finance stuff and, and, I mean, advocate for or against, but did they experience outside groups forming um, political committees that uh, tried to influence the voters? I really don't know how they did it, in, uh, in all honesty, Brad, if, uh, I don't know if Brad's still, yeah, there you are. Do you, do you recall? Yeah, I don't recall uh, Longmont or Fort Collins, those were uh, decades ago, but Castle Rock um, had a, a group very similar to our steering committee, had a group of downtown property and business owners that, that went door to door and uh, talked to their neighbors about it. Uh, Windsor, we were involved in Windsor not too long ago, similar type of effort. And I think we're expecting that here. Um, the steering committee members that, that were on the first slide that Dan showed um, are all very supportive of this. And uh, many of them actually showed up uh, on Zoom at the city council meeting um, on the first, first hearing. They were uh, 
pretty impactful actually with council in terms of their support. So to your question is we do see uh, the steering committee evolving into a support group, if you will. Um, I have worked in other towns where occasionally there's also a no group that pops up. So um, we haven't seen evidence of that in Englewood yet. Um, but we do see uh, we do see the business and property owners that have been involved with the process continuing to help with this. And I don't know, Hillary, is there anything you would add to that? No, actually, I think you've covered it. <laughs> I guess the reason for my question is that um, Tabor is such a hot issue here in Colorado, and there is the potential that there might be additional Tabor challenges, although the timeline is very short now for the statewide November ballot. But I just was thinking that there might be some uh, coattails uh, as for this vote, although it's a limited vote for just the property owners. Yeah, it's it's a fairly um, limited vote. And I, I suspect, I mean, this is a different topic, but I suspect the Tabor reform will have less to do about the voting and, and more to do with, um, uh, you know, the ratcheting, the limits on collections, possibly wording in ballots, you know, that, that may be something that, that pops up. But I bet we're gonna be voting on these kinds of things um, for a long, 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 long time. Oh, abs absolutely. That's not this Tabor is not going to go away and this sort of language is not going to go away. Thank you very much. Okay, any other high level questions? Anything at all? All right. Well, I just want to take the opportunity on behalf of all the commissioners to say thank you. A lot of work has already gone into this and certainly um, you know, there's there's a lot to come, but city council last night in support of the city council um, regardless of split vote or not, um, it takes a lot of guts to, to do something like this in this environment. Um, and in the long term, uh, I, I would say it sounds like we're certainly on the right path with the right team. So uh, I'd just like to say thank you to each and every one of you for moving this forward and to the city council for uh, taking the vote and uh, coming up with a negotiated $80 million limit. Uh, you know, we'll see where that goes in the future, but I think the other thing which is important is looking at the, at the two mills as opposed to five, which would be the state maximum. And um, years ago, we negotiated with the police department and they wanted a nickel to have a night shift uh, change. And we, I, we, we laughed and we said, really what you want is the, is the differential in order to be able to show that there's a shift differential and that it's worth more to work at night as opposed to during the day. And they said, yes, it is. And so that was sensitive to how it got handled um, and the value thereof. So the two mills makes a great deal of sense. If that, if that gets it moving, um, I'd encourage you to do that because Inglewood at one point in time was the place to be, if you will, in the Denver metro area. And it can be that again um, if we look forward. And so we certainly appreciate all your efforts. Would there be anything else uh, tonight you'd like to wrap up with uh, folks as we as we move on? I would I would just say on behalf of our city and consultant team that we appreciate the opportunity to come before uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission. You guys have been very supportful, supportive. We've had great dialogue with you. I think having you involved in the process is going to be a really helpful uh, check and balance as we get into these later stages. And I think you're absolutely right, uh, Mike. I think uh, city council and the way that they took this on, very, very, very difficult uh, ballot language and the implications, I mean, uh, really heroic, I would say. Um, I don't think, you know, I, I, it really amazing. So they allow us to go on and, and now enter the later innings of this effort. Uh, but just can't thank them enough. And, uh, you know, they'll, they'll want to put some guardrails in the final version of the downtown plan, but that's certainly understandable and, um, uh, and appropriate. So again, thanks for this opportunity. Absolutely. I want to thank you. And um, with that, I'm sure we'll hear from you in about a month. Uh, if you can hear my boxer dog in the background, apparently the kids are coming in 
from their version of 24 hour fitness in my garage. So there we go. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Well, why don't we go ahead and move on to the next item of the agenda, which is staff's choice item number six. So thank you, Chair Freemeyer. Um, I do have uh, an update on the Title 16 Community Assessment Project. Uh, we are ready at final last to move forward with this project. Seems like we've been talking about it for several years already, but we did bring Logan Simpson uh, consulting firm online uh, to start uh, this process with us. Uh, I want to uh, mention that the first sort of event will be a kickoff event on July 27th. And it is a Monday evening and it involves all of you here. Um, we will be having a joint uh, council planning and zoning commission study session that evening to talk about this very project. Uh, it's very important for us to uh, focus on the goals of what we all want the outcome of this project to be. For the next five months or till the end of this year, we will be focused very heavily on community engagement and getting uh, thoughts, questions, opinions uh, of, of the community, what's working in Title 16, what's not working in Title 16. So we are going to be talking about what that looks like in this new virtual digital world that we're in um, and how we can best reach as many sectors of the community as absolutely possible. So on the 27th, not only will we be discussing you know, what that looks like, how we reach the most people. We'll also be talking about the goals we all want to see uh, fulfilled with this project. Uh, beginning in the first quarter of 2021, that is when the actual writing will begin, the rewrite, the draft rewrite of this project will begin. So we've, we've built in a fair uh, amount of time in the next five months to to really engage the community and hear them. Um, so we'll be coming to you all, um, not only on the 27th, to hear your thoughts and ideas and what's working and what's not working, but we'll also be um, involving you all very heavily in each one of those months in terms of you know, getting the word out, uh, being champions for this project, trying to reach as many sectors and populations as we can. So we're well prepared to start the rewrite in January, February of 2021. So if you, um, some of you may remember Logan Simpson was on board uh, when the comp plan was rewritten uh, in 2015, 2016, time frame so they are very familiar with with Englewood um, and they are very familiar with a lot of the uh, discussions and issues and, and things that have that have been going on the past couple of years since the comp plan uh, was adopted so uh, we believe it's a really good fit uh, to start this next phase of of really reaching out to the community to to learn what's what's good, what's bad, what's indifferent. Um, you know, we as staff have already come up with quite a list um, as we work closely uh, with some of the things that aren't working very well. So, you know, we wanna get the ideas and brainstorm the ideas of what we want to bring out in these community engagement uh, efforts, whether they be online or, you know, outside in parks or, you know, surveys, one-on-one you know, -on -one interviews with people, et cetera, and so forth, whatever the end results may be. Um, so, you know, if there's a topic out there that we, we may not have heard so much about recently, but has been an issue in the past, you know, the 27th is, is a good time to bring that up. Logan Simpson will be sort of leading the discussion and uh, wanting to hear 
as I mentioned earlier, your ideas, your goals, how this project should go. So um, if you all could uh, mark that on your calendars, it would be a, a special non-meeting night for you all. We'll start at six o'clock. It will be virtual. And um, those are the sorts of things we're looking to talk about that evening. So to start, start thinking, if you will, now uh, of some of the items, topics, areas that you'd like to be discussed. Uh, and we'll get that all um, spelled out in, in terms of a management plan for the project, as well as a community engagement plan um, to make sure we're reaching um, as many people as we can through this project. It's very important and it's going to be um, that much more difficult to reach everybody we want to um, in terms of uh, you know being on this digital format. So we're going to have to be creative and thinking of ideas for reaching the populations that do not have computers or you know can't um, get to the park you know, things like that so any and all ideas are going to be welcome and I think that kickoff meeting on the 27th where both you all and city council are going to be on the call I think we'll start to sort of find the best strategies moving forward with regard to how we do this so that was my brief update on that if you have any questions I'm happy to answer Michelle um, I actually went to the first Pilates class we've been able to do down at the Mally Center last night. One of the ladies in the class okay. with me is a librarian down at the Inglewood Public Library. And um, one of their issues is, of course, how do we get the computers open to residents again? So uh, I sure. think the library might be a really good resource for you to try and blast out information um, because I think people are... are we've had a library diet um and i think that anything that the library puts out will be uh read quite readily and you might want to use that as a venue to um put out the word okay that's a great idea we also do have another meeting our second meeting in july the tuesday night before the monday night um, i'll talk with you chair freemeyer to see how we want to Maybe if we want to meet and brainstorm before that, or if we just want to do a memo um, for everybody that night. So we'll talk more on, on that actual meeting, but there's another chance for us all to talk before we go into that joint meeting as well. So, um, well, and of course, there's always Tony Arnold Lee, whatever is her name. Arnold Lee, right? absolutely. Yeah, to yep. you know, blast it out through her, of course, too. Yep. Okay. Any other questions for Wade? Yes, Kate. Um, I guess you kind of already addressed this, but I, if I can put, give my input, <laughs> I think it would be uh, helpful to have some more information, if possible, to look at, like, um, just the general scope of the project, especially okay. for some new members um, to get familiar with, you know, what it is that, that we're looking at for Title 16. And I guess I think it would be great if we had an opportunity to talk about maybe as a group what our goals are. Um, okay. Just my and, opinion. And, yeah, we can we can certainly do that on the. I don't know what the exact date is, but our second meeting in July. Yep. It would it would seem to me that it does make sense for us as a group. And Kate, that's an excellent point. And Wade, you alluded to it as. Let's, let's try to figure out an organized format so as we look at this in, in more detail, and we don't necessarily need to get, get there tonight, but as we look at this, what are the main topics of Title 16, number one? Number right. two, underneath those topics, these are the areas that we generally, as a commission, um, see where there might be issues or areas where, you know, hey, look, it's, it's worked for years and it doesn't seem to be a problem. But if we can go into that, um, into that meeting with the with the mayor and council, that would be that would be helpful. It would also be helpful to understand from a staff perspective and also to the, to this commission, um, 
in terms of governance. So is the mayor running this? Is, yeah, is it going to sure. be turned over to staff? How's that going to work? Sure. Yeah. And we'll, we'll clear that up and, and okay. get that information to you. Right. Excellent. Cause that, that would make some very productive for some, I would think right. some very productive time with the council and for staff and the citizens in general. Any other questions for Wade or comments regarding this? Anything at all? All right, excellent. Anything else on, on the plate, staff's plate for, this, for tonight? Not this evening, thank you. Okay, excellent. Next item on the agenda is attorney's choice. Dugan, you've been most quiet and certainly most welcome. Anything to add? I have nothing to add this evening, thank you. Words of wisdom, we appreciate that, Dugan. Big smile. You're, you're, by the way, you are looking good tonight on the video. Um, next item, let's go to uh, committee. <laughs> Absolutely, Michelle, he's looking good. All right, I'm just going to go around as I see people on my screen. Uh, Judy, um, anything uh, tonight in closing? No, I just wanted to welcome Colin. So welcome. Sorry, we're not meeting in person. Um, and as a little bit of an aside for um, your question about Swedish being involved in this stuff, they've also um, agreed to provide somebody to be on the board of the Chamber of Commerce as well. So they really are, um, people have worked really hard and they're stepping up to the plate at least from what I've seen um, in a way they hadn't before. So I thought you might find that interesting. That's all I got. Excellent. Thank you. Diane. I just want to thank the city uh, and all the consultants for sharing all that with us and all their hard work on that so far. I know most of them have dropped off so far, but, um, and also say welcome to Colin. Noel and I started not long before COVID started. So <laughs> welcome to the digital crew. <laughs> Okay, uh, Kate Fuller. A lot to add, but I did want to welcome Colin, and um, I did want to thank staff and the firm. Um, I think it's pretty cool to be a part of a community during this really not exciting 2020, or I guess you could say it is very exciting. Um, so it's nice to be a part of a community that's, you know, moving forward, looking um, towards opportunities while things are a little bit uneasy around the world. So. Thank you guys for providing that to all of us. Okay. Excellent. Appreciate the comments. Uh, Kate Townley. Uh, thanks. Welcome, Colin. <laughs> nice to meet you. Um, I just want to say it was a great presentation tonight. And also um, just wanted to commend the city as well for being um, able to be nimble and really you know, get some things moving downtown despite us being in a pandemic and we've had some good press on that, um, which I think is important and goes right along with the whole DDA, um, potential DDA formation and everything. So I just think that um, it's good to be able to, government usually moves really slowly. So being able to see our community move quickly and respond to business needs and community needs is a good sign to me, so. Excellent, thanks Kate. Michelle. Oh, you caught me by surprise. Um, I echo all the thoughts of the uh, speakers before me. Welcome, Colin. We had a little meeting beforehand and got to know each other a little bit. Um, that was an amazing presentation by the city. And um, it is really nice, as Kate mentioned, that to see some movement and things when a lot of us have just been sitting home, you know, not doing a whole lot. So um, looking forward to the future with all of us. Uh, and the city um, keeping things going forward in Inglewood. That's it. Thank you. Noel. Uh, yes, welcome, Colin. Um, glad to have you here with, uh, with good questions. Um, and yes, I've been impressed at every uh, group that has come to present, um, whether from the, from the city, from consultants, um, staff, um, it's been always a, at a very incredible high level, uh, which I've, I've very much appreciated. Um, and uh, yeah, looking forward to um, 
digging into 16. Excellent, thank you. Carl. Uh, the uh, city council voted to have a mask mandate approved and uh, it's supposed to take, what I understand it takes effect uh, Thursday morning. So I don't know, well, I believe it is only internal uh, where you have to have the mask on. If you're walking your dog in the park, I don't think it uh, is, is, takes effect. I haven't seen any details on it, but uh, apparently the city manager had it all ready to go and they, they approved it. So it's gonna, gonna take effect. I don't, I don't know. It won't, it won't really matter to me because what they want to be on, I do anyway. But uh, there is some people, supposedly 75% of the people wear masks and 25% don't in the area. So there's 25% that are going to have to change their, their methods there. Um, but, Carl, uh, just, to, just to add to that, I just got in my in my inbox a, a message from Tony, however yeah. you pronounce your last name, um, that describes that whole emergency order. Okay. Yeah. So that, that did go through, and I just wanted to mention that. Uh, that's about it. Thank you. Colin. Uh, thank you all for the um, warm welcome here. I'm excited to be a part of the group and hopefully I didn't ask too many other questions that were already covered. Um, but, you know, it's an exciting time to be in Inglewood. Um, and, you know, I think we all have a chance to make a really big impact on on, on the city moving forward and just happy to be a part of it and um, looking forward to some time where I'm not sitting in my basement to um, actually get together and, and have these conversations. So, <laughs> see you soon. Excellent. We wanted to thank you uh, uh, and everyone. Uh, but Colin, welcome to the welcome to the group. I think you'll find this this commission truly wants to move forward and help Inglewood in multiple levels uh, or on multiple levels in multiple ways. Um, just my parting comments. I believe everybody uh, alluded to this: adapt and overcome. Uh, it's a great motto to live by, um, and I think we're doing that well and we're all adapting and overcoming clear and present challenges. Um, you know, the city council, they can do what they want in terms of they have the purview to be able to issue an executive order, uh, as it were, or some emergency order. It's certainly individual citizens to decide whether they want to abide by that. We still do have freedoms. Um, Nancy sent out a training video a little bit earlier. I would encourage everybody to take a look at that. I think you can, it's an hour and 38 minutes long. I believe you can actually hit that to a different speed if that learning curve is a little bit, uh, a little bit easier for you. Uh, rather than an hour and 38, I think you can speed it up to like 1.25 or 1.5 times its regular speed. So uh, that, that may encourage you to, or be more encouraging to actually watch uh, that rather than spend uh, the better part of uh, a morning uh, doing that. Um, Apart from that, uh, there's a new RV storage park going in um, at the old, um, uh, what was that? Uh, oh, it was a business. Um, so right across, right across uh, old 285, there's gonna be a new RV storage park. I don't foresee that going away in the near future. Um, that impact of a decision will last for years and years and years because my understanding is they're highly profitable. and um, there we go, uh, Kate Fuller, I'll get to you in just a second. And, and um, so I see you do waving. So um, I would encourage everybody to think, to think through what, what um, opportunities are available. And while it may not be the best thing that we could ever envision, if it's much better than what's there now, we're gonna have an RV park for a long time. I've viewed a number of them in Aurora. They're not attractive. Um, even those with berms around them are not attractive. But in an industrial zone, we don't have any say over where they even get a berm. So we probably get a fence. All right, Kate Fuller, off to you. 
Um, so you just kind of inspired me to have a question about, are they a part of the DDA then? Because that would be within that parameter, right? It's, I, I it, would think so. The DDA would go to Kenyon. So yes, they would be. Kenyon on the south side. But do they lease that property or do they, are they, will they own it? The owner of the property uh, is going to operate, well, is, uh, uh, to my knowledge, the, the owner is going to operate um, the facility. Gotcha. Okay, excellent question. Um, seeing nothing else, I think we've had an excellent meeting and really very encouraging. Again, hats off to the city council. Uh, difficult times to take positive steps um, for the long-term good of the city. Uh, it takes a lot of intestinal fortitude and political will uh, to be able to understand what's actually better for the long-term and to be able to vote in that, that regard. So, and to those that, and I have no idea who voted which way, it doesn't really matter. The bottom line is they move forward as a city. And to those, those that, uh, that voted against it, that certainly is their uh, choice and uh, together we'll all move forward and this will be on the ballot in November. And uh, I would encourage each and every one of you to uh, continue to think of ways which we can improve the city uh, as we move forward. And with that, I will bid you all adieu. Please clear your calendar for the 27th. We'll look forward to our meeting in a few weeks. All right, thank you. Bye. Bye, thank you.